actually all of us go back to page four. And I'm looking specifically at measure 19. What happens is that that is a, a that is an eighth that was an eighth rest before it. So what I've heard every single time we just did it was, they lead it. Oh, blessed thought, all oh, work, but that's wrong. Blessed thought, all oh, work. So if you could think, it happens several times. It happens there. Um, it happens on page eight. No, sorry, page seven with the soprano alto line. Hand in mind, nor ever. Page 10, on the top of page 10, remember I changed the text to since God through all things leadeth me. Through all things leadeth me. Some of us still did Jordan. And I don't know. Jordan has a, a very specific connotation in spirituals, and I would like us not to. And these two hymns are based on spirituals, and I, I don't think it would be appropriate for us to use that terminology. So, cool. Um, that was lovely. I would like to do it again, more for me and Steve than for anybody else. Um, to make us comfy, I would assume. Oh, yeah. It's, well, it's I, to be listen, it's I love Tom Fetka. He's one of my favorite arrangers. He has the best choral arrangement of All Holy Night that exists outside of the original. But he, he does love a key change, and he loves a weird pivot. So, um, they don't always make sense. I'm trying to do this one more time, so that's okay with you all. Um, you can remain seated, but you try to keep some kind of steady beat somewhere because we are fading just a little bit. Um, and I know we're small over here, but these are two mighty voices, so I don't really need to start okay. Okay. Um, yeah. We might condense some. I may move you up and move those three up. Let's see. One, two, three, four.
heard a <laughs> like a <laughs> mystery. <laughs> 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 it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I got it. I just wrote it. Um, if you would not mind, Christine, <coughs> jump up to the front row, and I'll switch copy. Jump. <laughs> jump over the. <laughs> I will switch copy spots with you so that you can have your copy by you. Um, and then tenors, if you would mind jumping up a row, and then bases, if you would likewise do the same. Um, I have been asked to resume conducting hymns. I don't know why. I just there was a request. So I'm going to be here, but I will be conducting the hymns from here, okay? Like I used to, instead of the head bobbing thing that I've been doing lately. Um, so it'll be there. But also, see you at five till. Thank you. Peter, yeah, stop. So really what a lot of people don't work. know about me is that yeah. my previous life, I was the the I was the assistant director of operations for the biggest Chick Fil A in the world, okay, there which was the new Manhattan one when it opened. Um, so and while I have very strong opinions about their corporate giving, at the time they paid a lot of money. I made more money as a Chick Fil A manager than I did ever have as a teacher. Did you do that well? Oh, it was yeah. like thirty an hour, and I was like I was working probably. Like and you're not taking your work home. You're not prepping. No. You're like well, yeah. I was because so it was an HR employee, but I could clock in from home. Yeah. Like I could, like they would let me clock in but at home. Let me, say, let me guess that you didn't care that you paid the family you cared about your Chick Fil A. No, I cared because at one point I was like, I'm gonna have my own Chick Fil A because nobody in the world wants me. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then when I figured out that they did, I was like, cool, screw this, and left yeah. it. And then I had an accident. Yeah. Um, yeah. Life happens. Yeah. Um, but yes, I could be. I just am a little bit more So I checked on Thursday morning. So that before be they get printed. Great manager, but you're just not letting me. I, I raise my hand for what I can help. Oh, I'll be a great but superintendent. I'm a professional. Right. 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 I'm professional right. this person. Wait, I'm noticing right now. He's not listening to you. No, I know he's I, not. I'm listening. <laughs> I can listen to him talk at the same time. I'm not one of those people. She was saying I raise my hand to do things, but this is what I'm a professional at. This has to be on staff. Whatever. Because often it changes in just a lot. I'm a good proofer. I know. I mean, I may teach our proofreading our professional releases. That's definitely happening. Well, actually, you should, you should definitely have some type of job. I could do it again. Yeah, I could do it again. I could just ask, whatever I can do. I literally get to go to the Let's go, yeah. Let's do the anthem in the. 
Yeah, right? And I want to quote him.
Thank you, Alice. 
Good morning, and welcome to worship on this Women's Retreat Sunday. Thank you to those of you who have braved the elements and the cold and the empty seats to join us here in the sanctuary. And welcome to those of you who watch the pastor drop his folder, who join us online here in this church, no matter who you are. No matter where you are on life's journey, we welcome you here at all times. So this morning, we join each other. We come to God both to worship, to pray, to sing, and to hear God's word to us. So would you join me in our call to worship? Please stand. From the midst of our real lives, with their very real problems, we come to seek courage and strength from the presence of God and the support of one another. As persons who love imperfectly and are loved imperfectly, we come to be renewed by the perfect love of God proclaimed in this community of love and faith. As persons who never fully live up to their high calling in Jesus Christ, we come to be encouraged to do our best for one more week. Let us worship with hearts open to the love of God, with hands outstretched to one another, and with whole selves willing to accept the cost and joy of being Christ's disciples. Amen. Friends, let us confess together that we have not always lived as those forgiven, set free, and united in Christ. Eternal God, we confess that we do not expect and long for the transforming power of your love to work miracles in these hard hearts of ours. Yet we secretly long for a rescue, an escape, a miracle to relieve us of the responsibilities and the challenges you set before us. Healing Spirit, 
Renew our confidence in your power and in the power of love to change our lives and give us courage to be the fully responsible persons Christ calls us to be. Amen. Friends, it is with gratitude that we acknowledge God does not deal with us according to our transgressions. The psalmist reminds us that as far as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is God's steadfast love toward us and to all who trust and obey. God's compassion is greater than that of a parent, and God's forgiveness is sure. Bless God each and every one of us as people who have been forgiven, as people who know that God knows us by name, let us greet each other with a sign of that. The peace of God be with you all. Let us share that peace with each other. Peace. I know we're few in number this morning, but can I invite any young folk in attendance or any young at heart folk in attendance to join us? And we'll stand around the table this morning. There's only three of us. Well, I guess with so many moms away on retreat, dad's decided to stay home. <laughs> and I'll stop there. <laughs> How are you this morning? Good. 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 You see this quilt here? All these stars. After Christmas now, remember a week or so ago, we talked about the wise men coming. And one time he tripped. Right. And we find that a star led them to Bethlehem, right? Well, this whole season is called Epiphany. It's a time of light. It's a time for us to remember God. And these stars can remind us of how God wants to be in our lives as well. I have a question. Yeah. Why in the um, paper things that we read, it kept saying persons, not people? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Just the choice of the person who made the bulletin up, that's all. <laughs> and I did that. <laughs> Instead of saying men, women, I said persons. So. Next time you prefer I use people? No. Oh, okay. So when we see this during the whole time, we're in this season of light that's called epiphany. It's to remind us that that star that led the wise men can remind us of God always drawing us, always bringing us, bringing us here to church but also bringing us to each other so that we can see each other and we can be with each other, help each other, work together to do things in this world. Okay? So that star didn't just happen once. It's for us to remember 
every week throughout our year and throughout our lives. Okay? Let's pray and then you can... Are there learning centers today? I don't even know. Okay. <laughs> Forgive me, I didn't check on that. Let's pray. Dear God, Dear God, may you, just like this star, be a light in our life and lead us every day of our lives. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you, Megan. first reading this morning is from the book of Psalms. Make known to me your ways, ageless God. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Remember your maternal love, O womb of life, and your faithful love, for they have been from of old. The sins of my youth and my transgressions remember not. According to your faithful love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, gracious one. Good and upright is the fount of wisdom. Therefore, she instructs sinners in the way. She guides the humble in what is just and teaches the humble her way. All the paths of the wisdom of the ages are faithful and true for those who keep her covenant and her decrees. For your name's sake, loving God, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who are they that revere the Holy One of old? She will teach them the way that they should choose. A second reading this morning is from the Gospel of Mark. Now Jesus went out again beside the sea, and the whole crowd gathered around him, and he taught them. As he was walking along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. Then, as Jesus reclined to eat at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were also reclining to eat with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Now, when the biblical scholars among the Pharisees saw that Jesus was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard this, he said to them, the women and men who are well have no need of a physician. Rather, those who are sick do. Not to call the righteous have I come, but rather sinners. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God.
Will you pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations on each of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It would seem that the title over this week's gospel lesson would be Jesus, be careful of the company you keep. In this week's scripture lesson, it is not only what Jesus teaches, but how he teaches it that provokes a challenge. Jesus calls Levi to follow him, and Levi has never listened to or chosen to follow Jesus. Levi's profession sets him in opposition to the religious leadership of Roman-occupied Palestine. He is found, most likely, sitting in one of the tax toll booths located along main highways or at bridges and waterways where customs were collected for the regime of Herod Antipas, a client king, a puppet king, serving at the pleasure of the Roman Empire. In this story, Jesus invites a non-debatable sinner to follow him. Because Luke, or Levi, sorry, Levi has two strikes against him. He is ritually unclean because he interacts with Gentiles and deals in Gentile money. And he is a collaborator with Rome and therefore considered a traitor to his own people. Most tax and custom collectors were known to take a cut of the taxes that they collected, profiting from the oppressive taxation of Rome. Yet, Jesus reaches out and pulls this man, Levi, into the community of his disciples. And Levi, in turn, leaves everything to follow Jesus. In the scripture lesson, Mark uses the power of repetition to hammer home to his listeners by saying it three times that the company Jesus keeps is tax collectors and sinners. And after calling Levi, we find that Jesus is reclining at table in Levi's house so that this was no quick drop-in visit to check on him and see how he's doing. He's there to stay a while. By reclining at table, we might consider this a setting like a Roman banquet where guests reclined around a central table. Why does Jesus eat with tax collectors and sinners? The practice of the Pharisees, the separated ones, was to stay clear of contagion, uncleanness, contamination, in order to maintain their righteousness. By contrast, what Jesus is doing here is to associate directly with that contagion, that uncleanness, dining with tax collectors and sinners. There is some insecurity in the human spirit that desires and needs rules, certainty, control, principles to live by. And avoiding ambiguity and paradox in the scriptures and in religion enables us to feel comfortable in our beliefs and to have a clear sense of this is right and that is wrong. Jesus' response, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners. At Levi's home, Jesus is not revising the ancient purity laws. Jesus is defying them as they have been traditionally practiced. In the realm of God that he is here to announce and to model for us, Jesus wants us to understand that God's table will feed all who hunger regardless of class, religious identity, or purity status. 
This scripture passage is significant to us and to Levi for two reasons. First, Levi is individually accepted by God. And then second, the wider implication that all people who are religiously and socially marginalized are accepted by God. Specifically in this lesson, what Jesus is teaching is that those who want to be insiders in Jesus' group must envision themselves reclining next to the people whose politics and behavior they may find disgusting and then eating out of the same dish with them. Jesus gladly shares a meal with Levi, Levi's friends and Levi's colleagues. Levi's dinner table is an inclusive one. It is not only for the privileged members group, but it is open for the whole community. Around that table, God's grace and mercy are being offered even to tax collectors and sinners who are often in the scriptures grouped together with beggars, thieves, murderers, sexually immoral people, and Gentiles. This inclusive dinner party was filled with the joyful sounds of laughter and boisterous noise. For Jesus, there are no boundaries between insiders and outsiders. God's grace and mercy are not limited to insiders who are righteous, but is also extended to outsiders marginalized as sinners by society. By crossing boundaries, Jesus reveals the presence and work of God's spirit who makes the whole human community whole. Jesus is our epiphany. His example of table fellowship reveals a God who welcomes all of us without reference to our social status, where we were born, who our parents are, our physical appearance, how many degrees we hold, how much money we make, what we have accomplished in life, how old or healthy we are. These are not the criteria for receiving God's interest and compassion. All of us are welcome at God's table, and so is everybody else. To live into that spirit of divine compassion actively challenges social structures that impede the realization of anyone's full humanity. It is precisely the scribes, the biblical scholars among the Pharisees, those that were socially defined and self-proclaimed righteous ones who are most in need of Jesus' message. Yet they were the least able to hear it. For them, Jesus was a threat. He was disturbing their ease and comfortable status quo. Jesus' message of liberation resonated with the despised and vulnerable ones, the poor and dispossessed who flocked to Jesus and his message of divine compassion. The Reverend Al Masters, in discussing this passage, comments that a fundamental problem for Old Testament prophets as well as contemporary believers is that people do religion or do church as a substitute for doing justice and mercy. Jesus did not call and invite people who thought that they were righteous, but people who knew they needed God. And just as Jesus' call of Levi and his eating and associated with tax collectors and sinners created tension and challenge for the biblical scholars and religious establishment of his day, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whose birthday we celebrate with a national holiday tomorrow, did the same for the United States of America. It was not enough for him to use his pulpit for this purpose of saving souls, but the call of the prophets, as well as the gospel, to authentic justice 
for all people was a primary focus of his life and ministry. That call for the living out of authentic justice meant not just revising the Jim Crow laws that dominated the South, but defying them as necessary. Whether the issue was a seat on a bus wherever one chose to sit, or the right to vote as a citizen of the country is entitled to do, or the right to use any public water fountain, swimming pool, bathroom, lunch counter, unmolested and without danger of physical harm or being lynched. Dr. King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference that he helped found worked tirelessly to improve the lives of America's black citizens. Dr. King called on America to live up to the principles enunciated in our Declaration of Independence, that all men, all men, women, and children, regardless of the color of their skin, were created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. He reminded everyone, from the president, Congress, senators, down to ordinary citizens, that America had not yet lived up to that potential. In fact, he reminded us, America was failing its black and brown citizens, and he was reviled for it. Dr. King also called the church to account for its silence. Many of us know of his letter from Birmingham jail that he penned in April 1963. That may be his most well-known call to America's clergy, but I found a speech he gave to a conference of religious leaders in May 1959 to be as compelling, and a call to the wider church also to get involved. Dr. King was invited by then Vice President Richard Nixon to discuss how religious leaders might support President Eisenhower's Committee on Government Contracts in advancing its program of elimination of discrimination and employment in government contracts. Some of us may be uncomfortable when the church becomes involved in public policy discussions. Dr. King, however, was not asking for his own or his National Baptist denomination's beliefs to be written into the laws of the land. Rather, he looked at the problem of discrimination as not merely a political issue, but a profound moral issue. Dr. King regarded the church as the guardian of the morals of the community. And here is where I find his views cogent, even in 2024. He said, a religion true to its nature must always be concerned about man's social conditions. Religion operates not only on the vertical plane, but also on the horizontal. It seeks not only to integrate humanity with God, but to integrate humanity with, to integrate humanity with each other and each person with themselves. This means that at bottom, true religion is a two-way road. On the one hand, it seeks to change the souls of humanity and thereby unite them with God. On the other hand, it seeks to change the environmental conditions of humanity so that the soul will have a chance after it is changed. Any religion that professes to be concerned with the souls of men and is not concerned with the slums that damn them the economic conditions that strangle them and the social conditions that cripple them is a spiritually moribund religion in need of new blood. He continued, therefore, this becomes a grave challenge to the church and to clergy and laypersons alike. To meet that challenge, all churches must accept the obligation to create the moral climate 
in which in this case he was speaking about fair employment practices, but today might we not also add voting rights, the rights of women to make choices for their own health and the rights of LGBTQ persons that they are viewed positively and accepted willingly. We must utilize, he said, the vast resources of the churches and synagogues for the many educational functions they can employ and for which they have highly developed skills, facilities, and experience. However, to possess those resources is worthless without the will to be effective. The time has come, Dr. King said, when the churches are needed by their people and their nation as never before. They uniquely can break the deadening silence which engulfs the well-meaning white people of the South and today we might say of America. Dr. King's words are as timely in January 2024 as they were in May 1959 when he spoke them. Look up his speech. Look up all that he has to say. Toward the end of the speech that he gave, he said, we have reason to believe that because of the shape of the world today, we cannot afford the luxury of an anemic democracy. Speaking to the gathered clergy in the room, he called them to work assiduously and with determined boldness to remove from the body politic the cancerous disease of discrimination, which is preventing our democratic and Christian health from being realized. Friends, we are called by Jesus himself to give up our socially constructed security and to go in search of others who are in need. Jesus demonstrated a wide welcome and authentic love for all people as he reclined at the table in Levi's home. Dr. King challenged us to make that dream of American democracy reality, that all were equal, all were deserved at the table, and his dream remains unfulfilled. In closing, I will quote what he called his dream in that speech. A dream of equality of opportunity, of privilege and property widely distributed. A dream of a land where men will not take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few. A dream of a land where men do not argue that, do not argue that the color of a man's skin determines the content of his character where they recognize that the basic thing about a person is not their specificity, but their fundamentum. A dream of a place where all our gifts and resources are held, not for ourselves alone, but as instruments of service for the rest of humanity. The dream of a country where every person will respect the dignity and worth of all human personality. And humans, humans will dare to live together as siblings. That is the dream. Whenever it is fulfilled, he concluded, we will emerge from the bleak and desolate midnight of man's inhumanity to man into the bright and glowing daybreak of freedom and justice for all of God's children. Beware the company we keep. May we make trouble. May we make good trouble. Amen. We threw a little curveball at you this morning and we're actually starting at verse three. So don't get confused. Please rise and body your spirit.
we join now together in prayer for each other, sharing with each other our joys and our concerns. This morning, we begin with prayers for the women of the congregation and friends who have joined with Reverend Katrina on retreat. We pray both that it be a spiritually fulfilling and transforming experience and for safe travels back home. We pray for Liz Kaplan as she waits for the results of her biopsy, which she will hear this week. We pray for Chris Manning, the nephew of Suzanne Tuck, for Reyes Spurrios, the spouse of Charles Lau, for Ethan Ballot, friend of Lydia Fabund Connolly. We pray for Dick Olson, for Irene, uh, Irene, Ina Isobe's niece, Kelly, for the Reverend Cindy Reynolds, for the Reverend Bob Castles, for Dawn Ermler Fisher, and with gratitude, we give thanks for the recovery of Frank Toronto. Friends, do you have joys or concerns that you wish to share with the congregation, Susan? Susan gives thanks for the National Council of Churches that was able to gather together with other Christian, Jewish, and religious groups to find common ground on Israel and Gaza. God, in your mercy, hear their prayers. Scott? Scott remembers a friend who has been diagnosed with COVID and shares gratitude with many of us for Mike Spinella's hosting the men of the congregation last evening at his home. Rox? Rox lifts up celebration along with Peggy Sao that her daughter was elected vice president of Taiwan. That ties us very closely to what is going on in the Far East. Nancy. Prayers for my dear friend Lily, who is uh, now reaching the end of her life. Prayers for Nancy's friend Lily, who is reaching the end of her life. May God in mercy surround her with God's presence. Uh, two quick ones, and he's going to hate me for this, but um, one, a prayer of, uh, sorry, a joy, a great joy in the resource and amazing person that is Steve Usting. Um, for those of you who don't know, Steve kind of came in on a, like the last second to help me out with the piano, but more than that, Steve is just an incredible resource to me personally as a musician, but to us as a church. So great joy for Steve Usting, so thank you. He's also, yeah. You will notice he's not even attributed properly in the program, so, or in the bulletin, so. Um, and then a uh, uh, prayer um, for the, I work in Lincoln Park, the city of Lincoln Park. They are now on their third major flooding event in the last month and a half. Um, so one, a prayer for that community. Um, we, I mean, we have children literally swimming to the bus stop um, this week, um, truly. Um, and we've had school every single day, so they had somewhere to go because um, they can't be in their homes, most of them. So a prayer for them, but also a prayer uh, for our globe um, because we are in January and on the third flooding event in a month when we usually should have blizzards. So, um, yeah. Prayers of gratitude and thanksgiving for Steve Osting at the piano this morning. And a prayer for the people of Lincoln Park and those along the Pompton River who have been flooded out for the third time in a month and a half. And all of those around 
this country and the globe who are affected by climate change. Yeah. Uh, for my mother received her uh, long-term care insurance. She's approved, so she will now be safe and happy. Gracious God, thank you. Christine gives prayers of gratitude that her mom finally heard she was approved for long-term care, that she would get the funds she needed to pay for her care. Tim? For our congregation, as we prepare to meet next Sunday to decide whether to call uh, Katrina as our lead minister. Prayers for this congregation as you prepare to gather to meet and greet, as if you have not, but just to do it officially, meeting Katrina as a candidate, but then as you meet to discuss and discover what the, the Spirit has in store for this congregation when you gather to vote on the recommendation of the governing board to call Katrina as your lead minister. Are there any other joys and concerns? Then let us pray. Let us pray for the earth, the church, and all those in need, saying, God of grace, hear our prayer. Let us pray for our world, for the leaders of nations, that wisdom and integrity might prevail for the good of all people, especially for the poor and the oppressed, for regions torn by conflict too many to name, that peace may reign and living become an enterprise of construction rather than destruction. God of grace, hear our prayer. Let us pray for all people of faith, for the unity of the body of Christ, that divisions might not turn people away from the church, for Hindus and Muslims, Buddhists and Jews, that wherever prayers are raised up, the one God of all will hear. For all people who nurture life in the name of a greater good, God of grace, hear our prayer. Let us pray for our own nation, for our president and Congress, the Supreme Court, and all members of the judiciary, for state governments, city councils, local school boards, and all who have power to make policy, that their considerations might be given to what is most healthy for all people and creatures. God of grace, hear our prayer. Let us pray for those in need, for all who are hungry in our nation and world, for those who have no home and no employment, for those who are either unjustly or justly in prison, for parents and children who live in fear for any reason, for those who are sick and critically or terminally ill, and for all who are in mourning. God of grace, hear our prayer. For all the concerns of this assembly voiced this morning and those that have remained privately within our hearts, God of grace, hear our prayer. Gracious God, with thanksgiving, we remember all those who have shaped us in your ways. Receive our prayers and grant whatever you see that your people need through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Friends, justice for the oppressed, good news for sinners, strength for life's journey, these gifts God offers us and bids us to pass on. Our mission in life 
begins in reaching out to one another and extends to encompass the whole world in love and care. What is returned to God in these moments represents our commitment to that mission. We will now receive your offerings. As ministers of your new covenant, O God, we bring these offerings. May they impart new life to the siblings we know and to the many we will never meet. Help us to soar with the eagles as we give of ourselves. Bless the work of our hands as we reach out in your name. May all your people feast at the banquet table of your love. We want to help make that possible. Amen. You may be seated for the announcements. Tomorrow at noon at the St. Paul Baptist Church on Elm Street, there is a community service commemorating the life and ministry of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Everyone is invited to join with the Montclair African American Clergy Association and the Montclair Interfaith Clergy Association at that service. There is a special meet and greet with Reverend Katrina this coming Saturday from 3 to 5 p.m. in the Guild Room. If you have questions, something you want to ask, that is the opportunity to do that before the special congregational meeting on Sunday after worship, which is, as we prayed for, for the purpose of deciding whether or not to call Reverend Katrina as this congregation's lead minister. And the racial justice ministry team is establishing a Let's Watch series of movie viewing for all interested members and friends. The first movie is Selma, and it will be shown at 6.30 p.m. on Friday, January 26th in the Guild Room. It hasn't quite yet been decided, but it will probably be a brown bag dinner or bring your own dinner and viewing. So mark the date on your calendar together with those of us who are going on the civil rights pilgrimage as well as everyone is here. Welcome to come and view the movie together. There is another announcement in the bulletin I think I'm forgetting but you have the bulletin. 
read it. <laughs> Please stand and join in singing our final hymn. dear friends, go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God Almighty, our Creator, our Redeemer, and our Sanctifier, be and remain with you all this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs> Round of applause for Steve Boothsing, everybody. <laughs>